Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for today. We bless your name because of the principles we read of in scriptures for our personal lives and for the work in the church. We pray that you reveal these principles to us tonight from your word in Jesus' name. So that the work we do will be to the glory of your name. And it will also be to the profit of everyone that we minister unto. In Jesus' name we pray. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, I want to read the first five verses. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manien, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. We're studying about the act of God, the act of the Holy Ghost, in the church as we read the book of Acts of the Apostles. But in particular, as you come to the church in Antioch, you're studying the special move of God, and you're studying the acts of God and of the Holy Ghost, peculiarly and particularly in the church at Antioch. Many times, if we lack spiritual insight, we do not understand and we do not see the plan of God and the program of God for a particular local church. We have an idea that God is behind all the churches and God is walking through all the churches and God is fulfilling his plan, program and his project through all the churches. And therefore, because of the lack of spiritual insight, we do not see for the present time and for the future time for the present generation and for the coming generation, the plan of God, peculiar to a particular church, a local assembly. Even though there were many churches at the time of the Acts of the Apostles, yet the churches had a peculiar place individually that they held in the plan and the project of God. And we come to such a church as we study in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, today. Majorly, chapters 1 to 12 have been concerned with outreach to the Jews, mainly, majorly. And uh, the remaining chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, from chapter 13 on through to chapter 28, concerns ministering and outreach towards the Gentiles. Not only that, the single figure that has uh, been projected to us in Acts chapter 1 to chapter 12, majorly, has been Peter the Apostle, Apostle to the Jews. But as we read on from chapter 13 on to the end of Acts of the Apostles, the major character that is presented to us is Saul, or Paul 
the apostle. The work of the church has been centered around Jerusalem and the Jews, Samaria and Judea. As you read from Acts chapter 1 through to chapter 12. But now as you come to Acts chapter 13, on through to the end of the book, you want to see that the work is now expanding and it is uh, taking up from this place, Antioch, and uh, you want to see how the gospel spread to the Gentile world. And actually, we're grateful today that we are in the church in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in America, in the Gentile world as a result of what started in Acts chapter 13. The Holy Ghost sending out ministers, apostles, prophets and teachers from this church in Antioch and reaching out with the gospel message to the Gentile world. Now before we go into the detailed study of the verses uh, one by one, let's understand that churches, local churches are different. Not because they are not reading the same Bible, not because they are not preaching the same gospel, not even because they are not experiencing the same power of God, but because the plan of God, the program of God for the churches may be different. That is why if God has sent you into this church, you should uh, concern yourself with what the Lord wants to do in the church, rather than looking out to compare this church with another church. Now, take this church at Antioch and uh, look at what happened in this church. We're not comparing the church at Antioch with the church at Jerusalem because of the number. It's not a number a type of thing we're considering. We're not saying that the church at Antioch was larger, was greater, was more powerful, experiencing the Spirit of God more than the church at Jerusalem. But we're saying that God had a peculiar plan and program for the church at Antioch. Because just taking this fact, for example, that out of this church, Antioch, Saul rose up. And out of this church, you have Saul and all the companions of Saul. And through that, you have the writing of Luke, a companion of Saul or Paul. And you have um, the Acts of the Apostles written down by Luke, a companion of Paul. If that were the only thing that resulted out of the ministry of this church, that's a great thing. Telling us, giving us the longest history of the life and the ministry of Jesus, and giving us the only written history of the church at the time of the apostles, that's a great thing. Not only that. Out of the hand of Saul, that we read about in Acts chapter 13 verse 1, comes about 13 epistles out of the 27 writings of the New Testament. That alone is significant. And today, you have studies in theology all over the world, directing the church, telling us about every major doctrine of the Bible, every major doctrine of the Bible, all through from the hand of Paul the Apostle. And the theology of the church, the book of Ephesians, the theology of redemption, uh, soteria as you call it in theological schools, the uh, epistle to the Romans, all from the hand of the Apostle uh, Paul and uh, the prophetic utterances of the mysteries of the kingdom that is to come, all from the hand of the Apostle Paul. So, from this church at Antioch, you have the epistles that were written, and uh, that is very major, very definitely major step in, uh, in the church work, and the church of today built on the foundation of the writings of the New Testament, oh, a lot to the church at Antioch. Now, as you think about missiology, that is mission work. Now, uh, the uh, work that the theologians have to study from when they study missiology or they study mission outreach, you see from the writings of um, Paul, you see from the Acts, uh, the journeys of Paul the Apostle, as he went on what we call the missionary journeys. And from his examples, from his ministration, from his writing, from you get both the theology and the practice of missions. And all coming out of the church from Antioch. 
Now, there were many churches, as I've, as I've told you, in Asia Minor alone, you could name many, many churches. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, you could name many churches. In the provinces of Galatia, you could name many churches. But when it comes to a program, a plan of God for churches, outreach, establishing churches, planting churches, going to new areas and planting the church and getting in outreach, and you want to study how you can carry on a successful work of the church where you have never been before, you owe a lot, we all owe a lot to the church at Antioch. All that has taught us something, that we must leave to God, God's own plan for individuals in the world. You see, we individuals are different. Members of the church, individuals in the church, we're different. And uh, as individuals are different also, local churches are different. It will be foolish for me, for example, as an individual, to keep on measuring my life, comparing my life with the life of another individual. We're just simply, basically, dramatically different. And therefore, I should look up to the Lord as to how I lead my life, how I spend my life, what I do with my life, and what I consecrate to the Lord in my life because I'm different from the other fellow. Not only me as an individual, this church as an individual church. This church is different. Different not because we're so that we're all that peculiar. Different not because of the name. Different not because we feel we're better than everybody in town. Different because of the sovereignty of God. Because of the determination of God to do something different with this local body of Christ. And because of that, it will be foolish for this church to compare ourselves with any other church. The church at Antioch was just different. And this church, in the same way, is different. Yes, we serve the same God, led by the same Spirit, reading the same Bible, believing perhaps even the same doctrine, yet different different and we must follow the blueprint whatever the lord is um, leading us to we must say well as we heard yesterday thy will be done now let's come to this church at antioch another fact you want to recognize is that the church in jerusalem had been there a long long time now it wasn't that the church at jerusalem had backsliding no they were still alive in the spirit it wasn't that the apostles in Jerusalem had now lessened their study of the Bible or they were not weak in faith or they were not full of the Holy Ghost anymore. No, they were still saturated with the Word and still filled with the Holy Ghost. But the church at Antioch, different. You know, notice that all the time. With due respect to many churches in this town and in this nation, when it comes to age, when it comes to how many years the churches have been in town, this church has to just bend the knee and bow the head and say, yes, sir, to many churches in town. They have long been there. The Lord has been working with them for a long time. With all due respect to the churches in town and to many other churches in this nation, the Spirit of God is still working among them. Their ministers are still perhaps filled with the Holy Ghost and still perhaps saturated with the Word of God. Just like the church in Jerusalem had been there all the time, longer than the church at Antioch. With due respect, they are more aged, they are greater, perhaps even more in size. But the church at Antioch had a peculiar program of God they were to follow, and they must follow that. And the same thing in this church. We know there are churches in town. When it comes to experience, when it comes to age, when it comes to life, when it comes to the number of years they have been in town, we must bend and we must bow and we must say they are ahead of us. But even with all that, we must recognize God has his own peculiar purpose, his own particular purpose for a local church like this. Now, with that background, let's get into the deep waters we have in Acts chapter 13 from verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon and Niger and Lucius 
and my name. Now, there are five people that are named here, but it doesn't mean that there were only five ministers there, five prophets and teachers there. It says there were prophets and teachers, and it says, for example, let me give you a name, the names of some few of them, just few of them, such as, then he gives us five names, which means that there, have, there would be many more. Now, what makes a church effective and a church ineffective? What makes a church powerful, the other one not powerful? What makes a church dynamic and the other church under the same circumstances, in the same area, not as dynamic? In this um, passage we're studying today, we see just four things. Number one, men, ministry, mission, and ministration. Now you see, churches depend a lot on men, ministry, mission, and ministration. After you have taken the regular, similar factors in every church, because you know, when you talk about church, you are talking about uh, a group of people that have their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a constant factor. Any church, if it's a church at all, that factor is the same. Everywhere, the same Jesus we're calling upon. That's a regular constant factor. Now the factor of God, the power of God, now that factor is common in all churches. We all call the same God and through Jesus Christ. And if it's a real church, we all depend upon the atonement. If it's a real church, we're reading out of the same Bible. You see, in all churches, there are some constant regular factors that we all depend upon. The same God, the same Jesus, the same Holy Ghost, the same Bible. But then, there are other factors that are not quite the same. The men are different. You see, the men here are different from the men in other churches. The ministry here is different from the ministry of another church. The mission of this church is different. The ministration in this church is different. And these uh, different factors contribute to making the churches different. The other things are constant. The other personalities are constant. The divine source is constant. But then, what type of men are there? Are they spiritual or carnal? What type of ministry? Is it powerful and dynamic or is it weak and fragile and feeble? What type of mission? Is it outgoing and led by the spirit or is it carnally motivated and just com uh, committee inspired? What type of ministration? Is it by the spirit or by the flesh? You see, these, these are the things that tell whether a church will be effective or ineffective. Now, Coming back to verse 1, spiritual men. And these are things we ought to be looking for in our church. If we want this church to remain as dynamic as ever, as powerful as ever, as effective as ever, or even more, these are things we ought to be looking at, looking for. Spiritual men. There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Prophets and teachers. Now, in the New Testament, who were called prophets? Prophets in the New Testament were people that brought new information to a given situation. And they, were, they would rise up and they would say, Thus says the Lord. Now, as students of the Bible, please uh, understand. When you talk about prophets, there were different types of prophets, even in the New Testament church. Maybe you've never known that. Maybe you've never heard that. Different types of prophets in the New Testament church. I'm not talking of uh, true prophets and false prophets. I'm talking about true prophets now. All of them true. All of them inspired by the Holy Ghost. All of them ministering in the church. All of them true children of God, servants of God. But at different levels. For example, take Agabus. Agabus was a true prophet of God in the New Testament, but not a writing prophet. His prophecies were only for the local church. His prophecies were not for the universal church. You see, there were prophecies of a broad scope, of a great scope, and these prophecies were just for the universal church. 
But you think about Agabus rising up and saying there will be famine, and because of that, the churches in Judea just um, made all the resources, all the resources together, and they sent, sorry, the church at Antioch, they sent to Judea and Jerusalem. And that was a local prophecy. But when you think of a man like Paul coming out with the prophecy of the coming of the Lord, the prophecy of the rapture of the church, the prophecy of the first resurrection, the prophecy of the resurrection of the dead, and the prophecy that the bride of Christ will one day go with the Lord when the dead will be raised. Now, that's a greater prophecy. That one is a prophecy that goes right to the end of time and it is reaching down and that prophecy becomes part of scripture. There were prophecies of the prophets in the New Testament that never became part of the scriptures. You know, they prophesied and maybe they just gave a little information to a member of the church or to a family in the church or to a local assembly in the church. Well, that's prophecy, but it's of a limited use. But then prophecy far-reaching, very deep, very high, that comes right from the center of the heart of God, that comes into the scriptures, writing prophets. Now you see, that's different. And today, many Pentecostal churches, they misunderstand. They feel that since there are prophets still in the church, they feel that their prophecies are equal to the scriptures. But no, because even in the New Testament times, not all the prophecies of the prophets were equated with the scriptures. There was a difference made among, among those uh, prophecies. Now in um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21, let's see the prophecy of a prophet. Acts 21 verse 11. And when he was come unto us, he took um, Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Ghost. That's prophecy. Thus says the Holy Ghost. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Look at verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And then he gave out this prophecy. He was a prophet. And he gave out the prophecy about Paul. And look at verse 12. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when we, he would not be persuaded, we see saying, The will of the Lord be done. You know what he did? He disobeyed the prophecy. He said, I will still go all the same. I accept, as the prophet had said, I will be bound. Now, could he disobey scripture like that? No. Paul will never disobey scripture. That tells you something. That prophecy is not equated with scripture. There is a writing prophet, and when that writing prophet puts that thing down, the prophecy is um, inspired, is coming right from the heart of God, and it is the very word of God. It is equal in value, equal in death, and equal in weight to the very word of God, to scripture. You can never disobey that. But there are other prophecies that are not of equal strength, not of equal weight with the scriptures. And you need to understand that even in the New Testament, there were these differences. And in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, from verse 29, let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. Can you ever say that about scripture? No. Can you ever say, let uh, the preacher uh, read from the Bible and let the other judge the Bible? Never, never. You see, the prophets were not equal to the writing prophets in the Bible. Even to the Old Testament prophets that wrote down. No. The Old Testament prophecies that were written down from Genesis to Malachi, they, are, they were of greater weight than the prophets in the church, in the local church, whether Corinth or Ephesus or Antioch, anywhere. And today as well. 
there is no prophet that can rise up and give you a message that is greater than the message of the Bible. That is even equal to the message of the Bible. When the prophets speak today, their prophecies have to be judged by the scriptures. They have to be judged by the scriptures. And then in verse 32, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now that is saying, that is telling us, now when the prophet is rising up, but then the preacher comes on, the preacher will have to take the first turn. And the prophet that is just prophesying true prophecy, but he'll have to sit down and control himself. Why? Because the scripture is of greater weight than the prophecy of the prophet. But when that prophet is a writing prophet, that is different. When that prophet has been given a message of the mysteries of the kingdom, that is different. Now we have studied today, we have learned today, that in a local church there may be teachers, there may be prophets, in a local church there may be ministers, but their ministry is never equated with that of the scripture. Now it says there were prophets and teachers. How about the teachers? Now the teachers edify the believers by giving spiritual understanding to spiritual truth. Now what we do here is that we teach you. We can never change spiritual truth. Spiritual truth is there. For example, what we're reading today in uh, Acts of the Apostle chapter 13. That is spiritual truth. And what I am doing today as a teacher is that I am giving you spiritual understanding, explanation, interpretation, application to spiritual truth. It is a teacher that comes and he takes the truth that is spiritual and he reads it and he interprets it and he applies it and he tells you this is what it means and this is what it implies in your life. A teacher then will take spiritual truth and give spiritual understanding by the help of the Spirit of God and then the church will be edified. And do you know that the teachers had an exalted position and ministry in the New Testament? Yes, they did. The New Testament never, never played with their teachers, with the teacher of the world. And it is still so today. A real church, a true church will never play with the teacher of the word of God. And as you read in the New Testament, you'll see that, uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 28, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, first, number one, above them all, above all the ministers in the church, any time, in any age, first apostles, secondarily, Prophets, but now understand the prophets referred to here are the prophets of wage, not prophets like Agabus, you know, just to prophesy about a local event. This is talking about a prophet that will see right into the mystery of the kingdom, right into the mind of the Father God in heaven, right into the desires and the heart of, of the Father God in heaven, and bring it to the church and say, Here you are, spiritual truth to develop you spiritual truth giving you insight you've never seen before and then it says thirdly teachers now these teachers are not a people that get the message directly from god as a prophet no they do not have the ministry of getting it from the mind of god it's already written down it's already given out and now they just explain it and interpret it and apply it to the hearts and the lives of the believers but it's so important that these teachers come before miracle workers. These teachers come before evangelists. They come before all the other people, all the other ministers in the church. Very, very important. Because teachers held an exalted position in the early church. And it says after that, after the apostles, and after the prophets, and after the teachers, after that, miracles. Then, gifts of healings then helps governments diversities of tongues what do you find in other churches you find that uh, committees hold greater position than the teacher in the church in other churches governments administrators they hold greater position than the teachers of the word of god you find in other churches that helps 
those who have money to be able to give for uh, various things to do in the church they hold a greater position in the church than the teachers i mean in those other churches in town where they do not know the proper perspective and priorities of the word of god then you find that uh, healing and miracles they hold greater weight in the minds of people and then you have diversities of tongues those who can speak in tongues and also give interpretation when uh, tongues are spoken out uh, they hold the greater weight greater value in the minds of uh, people in the church world pentecostals and charismatics but you know really in the new testament first apostles secondarily prophets and thirdly teachers it's only after these have really carried out their ministry that all the others are allowed to supplement not to supplant not to not to get rid of the ministry of the teacher not to get rid of the ministry of the apostles and the prophets who know the mind of god and reveal the mind of god but only to supplement the ministry of the apostles and the prophets and the teachers now it says are they all apostles no are all prophets no are all teachers no are all workers of miracles no are all have all gifts of healing do all speak with tongues the answer is no do all interpret no but covet honestly the best gifts covet honestly the best gifts there are two ways of taking that in line with the context of the passage number one yourself when you are preparing for the ministry you should be asking the lord for the best you should not be saying well all i want is just to be able to raise the dead and cleanse the lepers how many dead are there in the world that you want to raise how many lepers are there you want to cleanse how many people are lame in the proportion of people in the world you want to work how many people in the proportion in the proportion of the population of the world are blind very minority but you know everybody needs teaching the blind the lame because you can get to heaven with a sick body but you cannot get to heaven with a sick sick soul and therefore the soul is important salvation is important the teaching of holiness is important covet honestly the best gifts and yet i show unto you a more excellent way that's uh, one way and one sense according to the context you can take it the other way is that now when you have a choice whether to listen to a pastor teacher or to just uh, go and uh, watch miracle happen covet honestly the best gifts which are the best gifts the apostles and the prophets and the teachers bringing insight from the very mind of god teaching the truth of god and the mystery of the kingdom if you have a choice that uh, you have to either go and watch a miracle somewhere on the field on a stadium or you come to listen to the teaching of the word of god what do you choose honestly you desire and cover the best gifts you say well i'd rather listen to another teaching of the word of god if i have the choice and what does it mean when we're holding meetings it means this that you never just allow every meeting to become a miracle meeting a healing meeting every time you must know that the teacher has a place the prophet has a place to bring the truth of god from the mind of god and the apostles who come to bring the truth very deep and very weighty upon the conscience of man they must be allowed miracles all right healings all right diversities of tongues all right but above all the teaching of the word of god if that is so if that is so what a pity that the thousand miracle revival hour draws more crowd than the monday bible study what a pity that people all over this world people in religion they do not understand that where you can have healing for the body you can have um, everything for your business for your family for the physical material things but i hope you understand you ought to get saved i hope you understand you you understand you need the teaching of the word of god and if our zona leaders are doing their work well they'll be um, putting their weight upon all the people in the house fellowship system you must come for the teaching of the word of god what a pity that even for such the scripture on sunday you know people don't think that they ought to hurry up and get to such the scripture meeting because they do not understand the value they do not understand the place that such the scripture holds in the life of every worshiper that comes on sunday i hope you tell the people that are not here that they ought to understand that searching the scripture studying the bible 
coming under the ministry of a teacher of the word of God, under the ministry of the pastor teacher, is very, very important. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. You see that? I'm proving to you from the New Testament that the teacher holds a weightier position, greater position, than just a miracle worker, than just a person healing the sick, than just an evangelist. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Paul, what are you saying? I'm talking especially of those who labor, those who labor in the word and doctrine. That's what labor is a very interesting word. It means to put all your strength into it. It means to bring all your faculties, your mental capacity, your brain, your mind, all the logic you have, everything you have at your disposal, and to labor to dig out the truth of God from the word of God and give the people the message from the heart of God that will prepare them to meet the Lord. And you labor like that in the word and you labor in doctrine. And it says when you see a man like that in the church, whose labor it is to bring the word and the doctrine to teach the people, you respect him. You give him a double honor. In uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and verse 13. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them that which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourself. In verse 12 it says... Now there are some over you, they labor among you, and they admonish you, they encourage you, they teach you, they bring the word of God to you. They are the teachers in the assembly. What are we to do for them? Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Because their work is special, the work of the teacher is special. The one that labors in doctrine, the one that labors in the teaching of the word of God is very, very special. And we shall hold them of that esteem. In Isaiah chapter 30, Isaiah chapter 30, we're looking at verses 20 and 21. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. You know what the Lord is saying? The Lord is saying, even though the miracle of supply may not come yet, even though the miracle of prosperity may not be there yet, even though the miracle of a surplus in the home, in the family, in your place of work may not be there yet, even though the miracle of promotion may not be there yet, though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and you're living from hand to mouth and the water of affliction that you do not have enough and to spare, yet if the Lord has mercy on you and he has not removed your teachers into a corner, and he has not transferred your teacher away from you, and your eyes are seeing your teacher, you are of most men lucky and fortunate, and you are honored by the Lord. You see, all through, as you study from the scriptures, you will see the exalted position that the teacher holds in the Bible. And it says, when these teachers have taught you right, in verse 21, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way. How do you understand that? You know, sometimes during the week, you are in trouble, and you get into a tight corner, you get into a crossroad. What helps you? What helps you out? Is it the miracle of healing? No. You remember that verse that the preacher preached on Sunday? That verse that the teacher taught on Monday? You remember that word that the preacher brought on it? The word. The word. Never forget. It is that thing that you hear from behind you saying, Don't you remember that verse that the preacher taught? Don't you remember the Bible passage that the teacher gave you the other time? And the verse will come out of your heart. And then ears shall hear a word behind this saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. And when you turn, when you turn to the right and when you turn to the left. You see, the ministry of the teacher is so important. And that is why if we're going to have a standing church, if we're going to have a, a dynamic church, an effective church, the men in the church must be spiritual. Come back to Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, 
verse 1. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. And there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now, just staying on that uh, verse alone, that verse 1, obviously we will not be able to cover all the 13 chapters today, but that's all right. It's better to go deep than to go far. Better to go high than to just run far. Now, you want to dig deep into that verse because now the thing in your heart is that you don't want to just be in the church and be a mediocre in the church you want to be a spiritual man in the church you want to know what god is looking for before you can say well you have a call you have a calling and it will make you a spiritual man a spiritual woman you know it's possible to just read over this verse one and go to verse two and go to verse three and cover the whole of the chapter in just about 15 minutes and then uh, we'll be able to say oh yes we have studied many parts of the bible and uh, you know we're very fast in our church and we've read the whole of uh, you know that passage but that will do nobody any good better to say just on that spot and get the honey out of the rock and get the water out of the well now in verse 1 it says there were prophets and teachers and it says such as and it mentions Barnabas first and mentions Saul last what do you learn from that you know many times we're unhappy if our name comes last but you know the last shall be first do you see any part of the Bible that was written by Barnabas? No, sir. Do you see anybody that uh, had uh, the real dynamic ministry as Saul that was named last? No, sir. Why do you worry? As to, well, they didn't call my name in time. They called me last. Does it matter? If you're a spiritual man, the gifts of a man will make room for him. There was something in Saul. There was something within Saul. There was something within him. The spirit of God, the power of God, the knowledge of God, the word of God, the, ministry, the mystery of the kingdom that brought him from the last right to the forefront. And in fact, he said, he, he that is least, that is not worthy to be called an apostle, he said, I did more than all the apostles before me. Don't worry about the fact that your name may be called last. Now, who was converted first? Barnabas or Saul, of course Barnabas, he's been there for a long, long time. But Saul came in almost at the last time. You know, it doesn't matter when you come into the church. It, it uh, depends on how you are receiving the truth you are, you are getting when you come to the church. And it is possible that while you are being sent out, your name may be mentioned last. Yet... Only God knows if you surrender yourself to the Lord what you'll do in, as time goes on. Look at verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me. What's the first name? What's the first name? What's the last name? And Saul. It looks like Barnabas was the forefront man and uh, Saul was the assistant. But wait until a later part in the chapter and come and see spiritual authority coming out of Saul. You see, it doesn't matter what title you are given. It doesn't matter. You know, here it was even it was even said there were prophets and teachers such as Barnabas and then Saul. You know, Saul could have said, Oh no, I know the gift of God upon my life. Don't just call me a teacher, don't just call me a prophet. I am an apostle. Wait until a later time. If they call you just a member, that's all right. Wait. If they call you just an house fellowship leader, wait. If they call you just a zonal leader, wait. Whatever name you are called, wait until the Lord himself will call you by the name he decides to call you in the final analysis. Wait. Be patient. Now, not only that, we can see that here, these men that are mentioned, Barnabas and Simeon and Lucius and Manaen and Saul, now it says that these were men in the church they were recognized in the church but then how about their lives now let's take one of them for example Barnabas from Acts chapter 4 
Acts chapter 4, from verse 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. The very first thing we read about Barnabas is that he was in the church, and then when the call came, that something was needed in the church to distribute to the need of the saints. He sold his possession and gave the money to the apostles. Aren't you surprised that after, after he gave his money like that, even though they called him a good name, son of consolation, aren't you surprised they didn't promote him to the rank of an apostle or prophet or teacher immediately? If you are a real Bible student, you will not be surprised. In those other churches outside, that's how you get promotion. If you're able to bring all your money, you sell all your property, you sell your estate, and you bring the money to the church, all of a sudden, overnight, because of the money, they make you now an apostle. Your money has bought the title of an apostle. It's not by the Spirit of God, not by the leading of God, but because we have supplied the money. But do you know it was never like that in the New Testament church? But you know, Barnabas did not mind. He wasn't trying to buy anything with money. He just loved the Lord and he just wanted to give to the Lord. That was all. And then in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he has said that he is the endeavor to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him. And now that he preached boldly at Damascus and in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. We're told about Barnabas, he brought Saul to the apostles in Jerusalem when he doubted his experience. And yet, later, when the Holy Ghost sent both of them out, Saul was the leading man. And Barnabas did not mind. He was the chief speaker. Barnabas did not mind. He was the chief apostle. And he was the chief miracle worker. Barnabas did not mind. How unlike many people. Oh, I brought so and so to the church, and they have made so and so now and house fellowship leader, and here am I, and I brought this person to the church. Be like Barnabas. Wait for your turn. Let the Lord have his way. Let his will be done. You are not fighting for anything, you are not fighting for position. I became a full-time worker before so-and-so. And look at all the material things they are giving to so-and-so. Wait for your time. Be le let everything be led by the Lord. Why are you jealous or envious? What's the matter with you? There is a Barnabas in the Bible. Learn a lot from that man. In Acts chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was at Jerusalem. And they sent forth... Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch who when he came and had seen the grace of God he was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of father should cleave unto the Lord for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord now you see that here Barnabas could be controlled Barnabas could be directed now you will you will see and understand that in this church, we endeavor to build this church. I don't mean the physical building. I mean developing the people. I mean training the people. We, tr we try to train and develop the people in this church after the pattern of the New Testament. Now, uh, what I find in many churches outside is that the people that have some material things, they literally control the apostles and the prophets and the teachers and the pastors and the evangelists. But in the New Testament, it wasn't so. And as you follow the history of the life of this man, Barnabas, a man that has given so much to the church, a man that has uh, given so much of his life, of his material wealth, of his property, you know, he was still under control. There, was, uh, there were tidings in the church uh, that uh, something was going on in another place, and they knew they wanted to send somebody to Antioch. 
and you know what who they sent they sent Barnabas now the first thing you that strikes you is that how can a rich man be so spiritually deep that he can send him to a church to go and do something there because all people most people that are rich that have material wealth they don't have time to study the Bible they don't have time to pray and when spiritual work comes you can never call them all you can call them to is uh, you know when you want to build and when you want to raise money when you want to do something physical and material what a shame but you know Barnabas having some material wealth having even something like an estate to, be, to sell and, and to give the money to the church when spiritual responsibility came that man had been in the Bible that man had been in the spirit and that man was deep on his knees they called him and he went as far as Antioch and it says he exhorted them he preached and he said with purpose of heart you must cleave unto the Lord he was a good man and he was full of the Holy Ghost and he was full of faith how I pray that everybody in our church here whatever we have materially physically will be men of the Bible men that are spiritual men that have enough time to get into the Word of God and study the Bible and uh, they will love the Bible and whenever they hear messages from the Bible they just say oh Lord that's what I've been looking for give it to me and then we're told that in verse 25 he departed then departed Barnabas to Tarsus and to seek for Saul now Barnabas do you know what you're doing do you know that this man you're looking for is a man of talent do you know that this man you are you are seeking for is a man of gifts do you know that if you give this all chance he may become the leading man Barnabas said I don't worry about that I don't care if I bring Saul to, uh, to Antioch and he becomes the leading man and he becomes a man that will have a great authority over the uh, Antioch church and over any other church. That's not my concern. But I see the power of God, the gift of God in that man and I want him in this church. Isn't that humility? Isn't that a man that is not looking for position or anything, but he just wants uh, whoever it may be that has the calling of God and the gift of God and has the power of God to use that power and the gift? And then in verse 26, And when he had found him, when Barnabas had found Saul, he brought him unto Antioch with the church, and he taught much people. And he so taught them that they were recognized as a real followers of the Lord, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch come back to Acts chapter 13 verse 1 now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas others are named and also Saul now let's learn now we've learned much about Barnabas alone let's see a little on Barnabas and Saul before this time I want you to turn back to Acts chapter 11 from verse 27 Acts 11 verse 27 and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch and there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the spirit that there should be great death throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Now it says here that a prophecy came out from Agabus, a prophet, but uh, a lesser prophet. I've explained that to you. A prophet, he gave this uh, prophecy concerning material things, concerning the local church, concerning a local need, concerning a limited need. And uh, the church at Antioch decided they were going to send relief to, um, to the churches in Judea. And uh, this was just a normal, natural, material thing. And they brought um, some material things together. We don't know what they were, perhaps clothes and other material things. But who did they send? Look at verse 30 which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul you know what we learned there there were people there are people in the church today who will not touch any work physical if we're coming to the church and we say now we're coming to carry sand we're coming to do something physical oh they say no 
I've had some great dreams when I'm going to become an apostle. And I know, my, I know my talent, I know my ministry, I know what I'm going to become, and therefore I will never touch anything physical. Aren't you misled by ego, by pride, by, by deceitful spirit? But you know, Barnabas and Saul, they accepted, they were going to do the work. And you know, sometimes I'm surprised when we're to do the work, uh, maybe building up a tent for retreat or wanting to come and do the work here at the fellowship center. I'm surprised I don't see uh, Zona leaders as they should be there. I, I hope, I suppose they're saying, well, we're Zona leaders, all we're to do is to pray for the sick and visit the converts and counsel and uh, do things that are spiritual. But as to carrying sand, how about it? You know, I'm surprised sometimes that uh, you find a coordinator is not even there. He's just to coordinate house fellowship and coordinate meetings. I'm surprised. You know, I'm surprised if we're going to have a retreat and we're going to do something um, at, the, at the IBTC. You are surprised that the choir people, uh, choir master, organist, and all the... Oh no, they are just singing spiritual songs unto the congregation. But are you learning from the Bible? Barnabas and Saul, they were there. And you know, that was said in the early church. That is how it was. And that is how it still should be today. Come back to Acts chapter 13. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers such as Barnabas, we've talked about him, and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. We've talked about um, Barnabas and Saul, but now we want to talk about the rest of the, the, rest of the Lord. Lucius, Simeon, and Manaen. These people had been in the church, they had been doing their best, and yet their names had never appeared in any part of the New Testament. At least in current history of the New, New Testament, as you know, all the people were going about. But the new uh, Barnabas in Jerusalem, the new Barnabas in Cyprus, the new Barnabas in, um, in Antioch, they knew them all over. And you know, they could have been worrying, saying, well, when will they know my name? They didn't worry about that. You know, it's not the day you come to the church, everybody will know your name. It takes time. It's not the day you become a house fellowship leader, zona leader, area leader, or you become a leader with IFL, you become a leader of visitation, or you become a Christian worker in the church. Everybody will know your name. Why this struggle? Why this politics? Why this fighting? Be patient. Just uh, sit where you are supposed to sit. Stand where you are supposed to stand. When the time comes, and it comes to the chapter 13 of current historical account of the church, if the Lord sees his feet to bring your name, your name will be there. But if your name never comes there and the name of Jesus is all the time there through your effort and through your work and through your hand, the name of the Lord be praised. Fight for nothing in the church. Don't struggle for anything in the church. All you have to do in the church is just come and lay your crown down. Lay your gifts down. And lay your talents down. Say, oh Lord, here am I. Whether my name comes up or not. Whether my name appears in the papers or not. Whether my name is given a title or not. Here am I. I just want to serve you. Now look at these people. Simon called Niger a black man. But you know, Jews are white. Saul, Paul was white. Barnabas being a Jew was white. Because we are told he was a... Uh, from Cyprus, a Levite, they were white, but here you see uh, Niger, meaning black. And you see, even though he was black, he was just there. Then Lucius of Cyrene, he was there. Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod. Manaen, his colleague now, had, uh, was this Herod the Tetrarch? In his own uh, youthful days, he was a man that was being prepared for a great sin in the political world. But now he had given his life to the Lord. And look at him now, he is in the church. And uh, sometimes the devil will come and tell him, Have you, you are hearing about Herod the Tetrarch, and you are brought up in the same court, in the same palace. You are brought up in the same environment, and nobody knows you now. And he said, No, I'm not fighting for that anymore. I seek for a country whose builder and maker is God. You know, that ought to be our attitude, but not to say, well, uh, I'm in the church now, nobody knows me. If it were not that I came to the church, I know what I will be in the world now. Uh, the governor was my colleague, uh, the president was my colleague, so and so was my colleague. Don't look back. 
Don't think back. If you are now in the church, remain humbly in the church and just take the banner of the name of Jesus and lift it up high. If your name ever comes into the register among the ministers of the gospel, praise the Lord. If he doesn't come, just make up your mind. You'll serve the Lord with all your strength, with all your heart. You see, tonight we have dwelt on just verse 1 and how deep it is. And all, is, all this is calculated to make us spiritual men. And I pray that from what we have studied today, God will raise up every one of us to become spiritual men and women, giants in the forefront of the work of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Rise up and let us pray. All you have to tell the Lord is you want to become more spiritual, more humble. No jealousy, no envy, no pride. No arrogance. And then you come to submit all your talent, all your gift before the Lord. Say, no, oh Lord, here am I and here is all that I have. I want you to use everything for your glory. And he will. He wants to use every one of us. Let's forget all the class distinction. All the social division. And I just say, give all our strengths and all our gifts, everything, to the service of the Lord. Making us to understand the scriptures like we do. Or bringing you to a church like this. With a God-given peculiar program. <laughs> 